I have asked uh, our wonderful political icon of Florida, Governor Senator uh, Bob Graham, if he like would uh, kick us off today. And so, Bob. Thank you very much, Bill. I appreciate your invitation to participate in this, uh, what's going to be an extremely timely uh, and uh, important discussion about division in American politics. Uh, Bill has uh, started a program based here at the uh, Smathers Library on ethics and leadership. Uh, and we have with us today uh, Professor John Mills, and who is teaching a class at the law school in ethics uh, and leadership. <laughs> John, thank you for bringing the students. Uh, I am Bob Graham. I used to do what Bill Nelson told me to do in the U.S. Senate. We both served there for uh, three terms uh, and uh, did so with uh, a great deal of uh, comedy and enthusiasm and, and occasionally actually got something accomplished, which was, uh, which was always uh, an interesting goal. Uh, Bill, of course, is very well known. He served uh, at almost every level of government uh, in Florida, uh, including uh, his last 18 years uh, in the United States Senate. Uh, we are proud that he has established this program and done it at the University of Florida, and we'll, where many programs similar to the one we're going to uh, participate in this morning uh, will be held. Uh, his co-partner for this discussion of ethics and leadership uh, is one of America's most distinguished historians, John Meachin. Uh, John uh, is uh, on the faculty at Vanderbilt uh, where he has a distinguished chair uh, in the American presidency, a topic on which he has written extensively, uh, including uh, in 2009 receiving the Pulitzer Prize for his biography of Andrew Jackson, American Lion. Uh, the topic of today's discussion will be division in American politics, and I hope that at the end of uh, this session, we will all have a deeper, more uh, nuanced understanding of what has brought us to the state that we are today in American politics, uh, what it's the consequences of this uh, will be, and what can we do to, to move to a different and more uh, mutual uh, path of thought and action. Uh, it is a pleasure to welcome you uh, and to introduce Senator Bill Nelson and Mr. John Beecham. Thank you. I would like for the students that are here not only John Mill's class, but any other students at the university, I want you to stand up and be recognized. Well, thanks for coming. And this, of course, is a treat for all of us. Uh, yours truly included, because uh, John Meacham is someone who has really uh, identified what's happening in America and put it in the historical context. And this, uh, not the most recent book, but The Soul of America, uh, around which 
some of this that we will be talking about today uh, is just one of his many books. Uh, he wrote the Pulitzer Prize book uh, about Andrew Jackson called American Lion. And some of these books, the university bookstore will be out in the lobby, and they'll have them in case uh, you'd like uh, to purchase a copy. Uh, John is not going to be able to stay because, and, and sign books because we've got to get him to uh, Orlando. Uh, Grace and I picked him up this morning where he was speaking in Jacksonville last night to the Florida Forum, which is uh, one of the activities that brings attention and funds to Wilson's Children's Hospital in Jacksonville. And then later on today, he's going to be at UCF in Orlando. So I was able to wrangle him uh, in between. With great charm. <laughs> it was a charming wrangle. That if I promised that we were going to keep him on time so he could get to Orlando, uh, and fortunately the university has provided the airplane uh, so that when he leaves here, he's going straight to the Gainesville Airport, and then it's zip, zip, and he's in Orlando. So, John, let me uh, kind of kick it off. And uh, you say that the history of this country is that <clears throat> imperfection is the rule. Uh, and you constantly point out to us that these cycles we go through, the wharf and woof of American history. Uh, tell us also about the politics of fear, which you have said it's present, but it is survivable. Well, thank you. Uh and what I found is that you just do whatever Bill Nelson tells you to do. Uh, and more importantly, whatever Grace Nelson tells you to do. Uh, so. The truth is <laughs> that you will find out that's the last thing I'm going to say. We're done now. Yeah, right. that's right. You can go answer the quorum call. Um, you must watch that and think that it's like a plane that crashed that you missed the gate on, right? Being in the Senate right now, uh, I would think. Um, we can discuss that later. Um, I, I do think that, uh, so I'm delighted to be here. Thank you, and thank you to Senator Graham. Um, I, look, except for the first chapter of Genesis, I can't think of an example where anyone has looked around and said, I don't want anything to change. Everything's perfect. I don't, you know, I don't want, this is exactly what the world should be. Uh, so the nature of history is a series of compromises, and you hope that more often than not, those compromises produce the greater, to use Professor Mill's uh, namesake, to use John Stuart Mill, the greatest good for the greatest number, right? So the American experiment is arguably the most complicated experiment in government and politics that's ever been undertaken globally. Because think about it, no one has tried to do what you and Senator Graham did, which is to govern a pluralistic, multi-ethnic polity over this expanse of territory with this clash of interests and try to balance the division of power between the private and the public. Just nobody's done it. You know, there's this argument now about uh, were we founded in 1776 or were we founded in 1619? Right, really interesting question. My suggestion is that we're actually only 55 years old. That in 1965, we became the country we are today. That before the Civil Rights Act, before the Voting Rights Act, and before the Immigration Act of 1965, which undid the 1924 Immigration Act that capped immigration at national quotas, which is the reason we couldn't allow many refugees from the Third Reich into the country. That was the law of the land until 1965. That it's no wonder we're having so much trouble 
at the moment, so much unhappiness, so much division, because we've only been doing this for a half century or so. You know, I've never heard people say, oh, particularly, and I love them, I love everyone who watches MSNBC, but, and I've met all of them, um, <laughs> usually in Southwest Airline lines, uh, and people will say, oh, I watch you all day, and I think, you know, you need to get out more. <laughs> you know, it's like, you know, we, we can get you some, you know, liberal meals on wheels, maybe, to get you fed. But um, if, you've watched, if, if you're that engaged, then you think it's never been worse. Your former colleague, John Lewis, has never said it's never been worse. Right? He was nearly killed on the streets of Selma, Alabama, and the streets of Montgomery, and Rock Hill, South Carolina, and put in prison in Parchman in Mississippi, within the living memory of a lot of us in the room. So I do think we have to tap the brakes on the hyperbole of the present. I'm not minimizing what's going on, I promise. But I do think we have to look at it proportionally. And if you look at something proportionally, it does suggest certain diagnostic, certain uh, metaphorical ways of, of addressing it. It's, to me, it's always been fascinating that so much of our political language is rooted in the vernacular of health, right? So the body politic, the uh, corruption originally meant disease, not graft. Crisis is from Hippocrates. A crisis initially was the moment of decision in the course of a disease where the patient lived or died. So all of that language comes out of something that was so important, it was as significant as our own health. And so if you play the metaphor out without torturing it too much, then there are certain symptoms that recur that suggest different therapeutic approaches. And my own view, to go to the warp and woof point, is that we're more often divided than we're united. Well, let's look at that. Uh, and and this, uh, this idea of fear that is here, uh, and yet, We've seen that before many times. So if John Lewis says that he's never seen it this bad, uh, even though he was nearly clubbed to death, but what must it have been like just before the Civil War? Oh, I, th I think, well, what's disturbing about that question is there was a ferociously divided, divided press, partisan-driven press, uh, two large tribes of white Americans who didn't want to talk to each other, much less listen to each other, and a sense of existential dread if the other side got even a yard. So that's not a great analogy for how things are going to go, right? Uh, are things as bad now as they were in the 1850s? There's certainly that argument to be made. But again, we, we lived in this state, in my native state, I'm from Tennessee, I lived there, we lived under apartheid 50 years ago. So let's not get overly nostalgic about some era of great bipartisan Valhalla-ism uh, where, you know, everybody walked around in frock coats and powdered wigs and saved Medicare, right? I mean, they just didn't, there are those moments and we celebrate them and we have to study them so that we can try to emulate them, but they're going to be the exception, not the rule. So if we had been here 100 years ago, in 1920, what would be going on? We'd be living under absolute terror that the Bolshevik Revolution, I just saw your, uh, your what, red clawed pepper, right, uh, down in the, down in the uh, lobby. The anxiety was that the Bolshevik Revolution was going to come here and what were the means of that revolution going to be? It was going to be Jewish or Catholic immigrants because the, and the, the second Klan was refounded in 1915. The 1924 Democratic National Convention went to 103 ballots because there were 347 Klan delegates at Madison Square Garden who would not vote for Al Smith, the governor of New York, to be the Democratic nominee because he was an Irish Catholic. And Roman Catholicism was seen as the Sharia law of the era. Oregon passed a law saying that no school child could go 
to any institution of education other than a public school. It was an attack on the nuns. It was an attempt to take apart parochial education. And, because, and who, were, who were the Catholics? Immigrants, Southern Europeans. Governor of Georgia, a guy named Clifford Walker, lost an election because he wasn't a member of the Klan, joins the Klan and becomes governor, and says at a Klan meeting in Kansas City in 1924 that we need to build a wall of steel as high as heaven to keep the immigrants out. Any of this sound familiar? So, so, the, and so what was going on in the 20s was uh, lots of immigration, the move from, from agrarian to industrial, the a shifting media climate. If you were a householder in America before 1921 to 24, you totally controlled the means of information that came into your household, right? You decided what papers to subscribe to, you decided where to go to church, you decided which neighbors to invite in, and then suddenly you buy this thing called a radio, and there's this world coming to you. We think of this as this great story about Franklin Roosevelt, and it brings in exciting, totally true. But for a large portion of the country, it was disorienting. Nobody ever heard of Hollywood. Who runs Hollywood? Why are they bringing this to me? So, you know, we've been trying to make America great again since about 1800, right? The first campaign, based on nostalgia, look this up, was in 1800, when Thomas Jefferson ran saying, we have to restore the principles of 1776. There were no red hats, I don't think. But besides that, it was basically the idea that we have to hearken back. If we've been trying to hearken back since 1800, I think we're going to be with that for a long time. So is what you're saying that American history is inextricably entwined with racism? Yeah. <laughs> Senator? Of course it is. And is that any different from elsewhere in the world? And what makes well, the our handling of it different? I'm not a good comparative student, so I will, I will say that the global history of slavery is immensely complicated. It is not just an American issue, although it drives me crazy when we say that because it's okay, that's fine, but it doesn't change the basic facts on the, on the ground here. Um, of course, it's, it, it's inextricably tied up with racism, with xenophobia, with isolationism, uh, with nativism. It's also, and here's the redeeming part of the story, it's also inextricably bound up with an aspiration to make real what was the most important sentence ever originally rendered in English, that all men are created equal and endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. We have an aspiration, unlike a lot of countries, we were founded on an idea. We weren't founded explicitly on an ethnic or, or uh, racial, there were exclusions. But the idea was if you assented to this ideal, you could come here and be part of this experiment. And that's a noble thing. And so that is the central point of what is the soul of America. Well, the soul of America, and your, your, your friend and former colleague, Senator Biden, uh, Vice President Biden and I talk about this, um, he thinks that the soul of the country can be redeemed by a certain election, perhaps the election of himself, maybe, just throwing that out there. Um, who knew? Uh, and he may be right. Uh, my argument is a little bit different and very dorky, so, but y'all are here, so. Um, the soul is not, <clears throat> in my view, something that can be redeemed or condemned by one action or one election. It's an arena of contention. So think about your own lives. So we're all in a struggle between our better angels and our worst instincts, right, every day. And if you're anything like me, and if your better angels win 51% of the time, that's a heck of a good day. And for me, it doesn't happen much. I'm sure it happens for you much more often. Uh, but the uh, uh, soul means breath or life in Hebrew and in Greek. And so I think it's <clears throat> a perennial struggle to get things right. And so the story of the country 
is the story of a collection of individuals trying to get things right at given periods of time. Best definition of a nation I've ever run across, <clears throat> excuse me, is from St. Augustine. And he said in the City of God that a nation is a multitude of rational beings united by the common objects of their love. A multitude of rational beings united by the common objects of their love. And so one of the things we have to ask ourselves is what do we love in common? And at it, the eras that we want to commemorate, the eras that we want to emulate, Americans have loved in common the idea of fair play, the idea that everybody gets a chance, the idea that though we can't guarantee outcomes, we can guarantee that, as President Lincoln said, everybody has a fair chance for their industry, intelligence, and enterprise. Let me ask you something. So you, you were elected in 1978 at the federal level, right? So tell us, if you would, how different is it now 40 years on, a biblical 40 years, that makes you Moses. There's kind of a Charlton Heston thing going on. I can kind of see that. Uh, but I don't have a beard. Or, or a musket with you, so that's good. <laughs> Although it's Florida, so maybe you're supposed to, sorry. Uh, so tell me what, uh, the Washington you came to and the Washington you left, what changed? The Washington I came to was um, Tip O'Neill, speaker, <clears throat> Bob Michael, the Republican leader. They'd fight like cats and dogs. At the end of the day, they were personal friends. And when it was time to get it done, they did it. Another example, uh, one of the great examples of, uh, of government working, 1983, Social Security was within uh, six months of going bankrupt. Two old Irishmen, one named Reagan, the other one named O'Neill. They got together and they said, we're going to fix this. They appointed a blue ribbon panel, reported back to the Congress. We overwhelmingly voted it. And by the way, when they appointed that panel, they said that we agree we are not going to use Social Security as a club to hit your opponent over the head in the next election. We're taking it off the table. So you contrast that today. The two parties, they meet separately. We were all in the House back in those days. We were in and out of each other's offices, good friends. Now there is a division. There's a hostility. Now how do we write this, John? Well, how did, give me one or two reasons. What changed? What, what led to this? Because then if you understand how it happened, then you can understand how to address it. Okay, one thing uh, that's happened is that the idea of being ladies and gentlemen started to go out the window when politics took front and center to win in the next election. Kind of uh, a thought of ethics and morality. Um, I remember going to the Senate and met Mike Mansfield, who used to come to the weekly prayer breakfast as a retired senator. And, and Mike Mansfield, uh, the story is told that a Democratic senator, when Mansfield was the majority leader, went and told a Republican senator that he was going to do something and then he went back on his word. And Mike Mansfield went as the Democratic leader to that Democratic senator and said, if you don't keep your word, I'm going to speak out against you. Can you imagine Mitch McConnell doing that against a Republican senator? So there's something about the, the everyday gentlemanliness that is gone. Now, it's egged on 
by instant communication, although when I came in 78, there was instant communication, there, but there wasn't emails and Facebook where untrue stories can go up. Uh, certainly the President of the United States did not say uh, the press corps was fake news. I saw a respect for the fourth estate. Uh, and certainly there was not this instant communication, this hunger to fill every minute of every hour with breaking news. Yeah, that's, that's absolutely right. So how do we change it, John? I think, I'm glad you asked, Senator, because um, I have the answer to save the country, and I, I've been waiting to come to Gainesville to share it with you. Um, uh, I think, to some extent, both sides are the victims of their own tactical success, right? So, Newt Gingrich, uh, your former colleague, who in many ways personifies the radicalization, right? I mean, the going to the floor, the, the first cable news channel was C-SPAN, basically. Uh, and he would go speak to an empty chamber and attack everybody. And uh, there's a great story about, um, here, here's something else, to, else about the uh, contingencies of history. If, uh, if you all had, if the Senate had confirmed John Tower to be Secretary of Defense in 1989, arguably 1994 and the rise of Gingrich doesn't happen because George Herbert Walker Bush nominates his old Texas friend, John Tower, to be Secretary of Defense. Uh, that falls apart for various reasons. They need a Secretary of Defense very quickly. So on a Friday, they call Dick Cheney. Dick Cheney comes over, be becomes the nominee, and that creates an opening in the House leadership for a young guy from Georgia named Gingrich, who gets on the leadership ladder. So uh, it it's a little bit like the old story about would the 1930s have ended the same way if the uh, assassin down in Miami who shot at Franklin Roosevelt in 1932 had not hit the mayor of Chicago who was sitting next to him in the car, or if Winston Churchill, who stepped out on Fifth Avenue and looked, thought he was in London and looked the wrong way. This is the only case of drunk driving where the, the drunk wasn't driving. Uh, uh, and he's hit by a car and almost dies. Um, you know, would, would the world be the same? So uh, when Bush becomes, so Gingrich rises, and Bush gets nervous about this because he knows that Gingrich is this hardcore uh, slashing guy. And so when he becomes the whip, right, uh, Bush reaches out to Gingrich and to Vin Weber uh, from Minnesota, I think. Uh, and Vin had run, uh, these are two members of the House, Vin had run Gingrich's campaign. And so Bush, who'd been in the House and from 66 to 70, loved the House, always kept a locker in the House gym. Uh, he reached out, asked them to come have a drink at the White House. And so they're sitting around, and as Vin, Vin Weber told me the story, and Vin said, jo only George Bush would think to invite the guy who ran the whip campaign, right? It, it's, it was a typically thoughtful thing to do. So they're sitting around, and they can tell that Bush is worried about something, and he's not really saying what he means. And so finally, as they're leaving, Vin says, Mr. President, is there anything that worries you about us? And Bush is kind of relieved to have the chance to say something. So he says, there is. I worry that your idealism might get in the way of what I think of as sound governance. And Weber said he always appreciated that Bush said idealism. He didn't say ideology. He didn't say inflexibility, though that's what he meant. He didn't say craziness. But Bush, though he ran an incredibly partisan campaign to become president, on the moment of becoming president, he actually thought about the national interest. And it's this is not quaint. This is not nostalgia. This is, I've listened to the man's diary. He, George Bush would never complain to anyone else 
so he only complained to himself. He did it into this tape recorder. And everything he did that led him to get 39% of the vote in 1992, right? Now they want to put him on Rushmore. He couldn't get 40% to send him back to office. Everything he did, he did knowing that it would hurt his political self-interest. But he was willing to do it. And when he was buried last year, he was buried with all the honors of a statesman. And I would argue far more warmly, is far more warmly remembered because he did things that cost him that job. And he hated losing that job. He goes into Galveston, he's going fishing the week after the inauguration when Clinton takes office. And the woman looks at him and says, you look kind of familiar. You know, how quickly they forget, right? Uh, it's kind of like the great Jim Baker story about, um, can you mention Baker in Florida? I guess you can. Uh, yes. so, so Jim Baker ran for Attorney General of Texas in 1978, and he loses, and he's on his way out to the ranch to uh, lick his wounds uh, that weekend, and he's filling up his truck, and an old boy walks up to him and says, anybody ever tell you you look a lot like Jimmy Baker? Baker said, yeah, sometimes. The guy said, doesn't that just piss you off? So anyway, uh, uh, by the way, uh, I want to remind you that he wrote the biography on George H.W. Bush and then the signal honor of being asked to speak at George Bush's funeral ahead of time by George Bush read to him the speech, the eulogy that John was going to give so that George H.W. Bush could hear what was being said. Now, I heard a story that you told about George Bush when uh, President Trump was coming to Nashville and you wrote an op-ed. Tell that story. So yeah, this is absolutely true, um, the, unlike most of what I say. So... Um, uh, so in March of 2017, uh, President Trump announces that he's coming down to Nashville, where I live, to lay a wreath at the grave of Andrew Jackson. And presidents always see as they wish to be seen, right? So when they try to associate themselves with a predecessor, they always want sanction or inspiration or c cover sometimes. And so Jackson, had, uh, uh, Trump had decided that he wanted to be Andrew Jackson. I think he thought he was going to Michael Jackson's house. But... Um, <laughs> You know, where are the llamas, you know. But anyway, uh, but he was going. And um, so I'm sitting at home, and I'm thinking I should do something. So I'm a Jackson biographer. I live here. So I wrote an open letter to the president saying, Dear Mr. President, you know, welcome, delighted you're embracing history. But if you're going to embrace Andrew Jackson, don't just embrace the crazy parts. And there are plenty of crazy parts of Andrew Jackson to embrace, right? Jackson once said that his only two regrets in public life were that he had not hung Henry Clay, the Speaker of the House, and shot John C. Calhoun, his own vice president. We now know that no one felt that way about their running mate until John McCain. But anyway, uh, so, uh, but he was a unionist. He kept us together. He gave us an additional 30 years to form what Lincoln would call the mystic chords of memory. Important figure. So I wrote this op-ed, uh, the open letter, and sent it to the local newspaper. It was the entire front page of the paper. That's the only thing they put on the paper that day. Uh, it had no effect whatever on President Trump. I know that was shocky. So the next day, I'm walking into lunch, and my phone rings, and it was George H.W. Bush. And the president spent a lot of that, former president spent a lot of that winter in the hospital down in Houston. So his staff was printing out stuff for him to read. They'd given him this letter. So he called up. He said, how you doing? I said, I'm fine, Mr. President. The key to doing his voice, by the way, is, uh, as Dana Carvey once said, is Mr. Rogers trying to be John Wayne. You know, <laughs> not going to do it. Um, I said, I'm fine, sir. How are you? He said, I'm fine. He said, I read your letter to Jackson. I thought, oh, no, the old boy is losing it, right? He thinks I'm writing letters to dead people. So I said, thank you, sir. But, you know, actually, that was a letter to Trump about Jackson. And without missing a beat, the old man said, yeah, but Jackson will pay more attention. So... <laughs> And then he hung up. He thought of the joke. He wanted to deliver it. Said, "I right, see ya." Click. That was it. Uh, but so, but this is a, a long way to answer your question. What matters is how do you want to be remembered? 
I'm not saying just do the right thing because you should do the right thing. I'm not that naive. The, it seems to me an understanding of human nature suggests you have to appeal to people's appetites, ambitions, and vanity. And the vanity of a public figure is how will you be remembered? And so I call it the portrait test. What do you want us to think when we look at your portrait? Do we want to look and say, oh, you, you served a long time, but you took a dive for McConnell or Schumer or Foley or Michael, whatever it is? Or do you want us to look at and say, you know what? In the breach, you stood up for a larger cause that might cost you something. And there's a reason we're in the Smathers Library and his friend John Kennedy wrote Profiles in Courage. It's not very long and it's one volume. Right? There's not a lot of raw material here. So there's a, there's a huge opening for people who want to say, you know what, I would like people down the years to be talking about us. Final point on this, I'm going to say a name that would not be spoken in this moment if she had not done just that. Margaret Chase Smith. Margaret Chase Smith, senator from Maine in 1950, not three months after Joe McCarthy's speech in Wheeling, West Virginia, gives a speech called the Declaration of Conscience, laying out the entire case against Joe McCarthy. It took the men four years to catch up. Half the Republican caucus in December of 1954, 22 Republican senators voted to censure one of their own. Margaret Chase Smith had called on him to do it four years before. Do you want to be Joe McCarthy or do you want to be Margaret Chase Smith? So a great public servant, as you point out in your books, for example, a president is often one who goes against his base. Almost and, always. And so Nixon went to China. Uh, give us some other examples. Reagan and the Cold War. Right? He's playing with babies in May 1988. Jimmy Carter said we, we risk Armageddon if we elected this man. And he's literally, he and Howard Baker are standing there playing with babies. Uh, Lyndon Johnson, from a segregated state, helps finish the work of Lincoln. Harry Truman, a provincial figure from Missouri, total compromise candidate, total, talk about a contingency. FDR had put Henry Wallace on the ticket. Uh, it was sort of like kind of an Al Gore, sort of a mystic, you know, he, like Prince Charles, he talked to plants and stuff. He was just kind of a weird guy. Uh, but he put him on, he needed to shore up the left in 1940. He puts Henry Wallace on the ticket. Henry Wallace is very far to the left. 1944 comes along. He needs to get rid of Wallace. His favorite, the person he wanted to put on the ticket, was Jimmy Burns from South Carolina. South Carolina is a segregated state. Can't do it. That's too far to move. Any of this sound familiar? I mean, this is Franklin Roosevelt. I know we think of him as this Olympian figure, you know, if they had wheelchairs on Olympus. But... This is all the raw political calculation. These are real people making real decisions in real time with the same calculus and the same circumstances that we see all the time. He, so they need a compromise. Harry Truman is the compromise. Truman, Missouri is somewhat segregated, but not totally. Truman's a totally provincial figure. Been out of the country once during World War I. He becomes president on April 12, 1945. When he walks in to the White House, and Eleanor, Mrs. Roosevelt, tells him that Franklin has died at Warm Springs. He says, is there anything I can do for you? She says, no, Harry, the question is, is there anything I can do for you, for you are the one in trouble now? <laughs> Imagine that, April 12th, Adolf Hitler is alive. The war in Japan is estimated to last another two to three years. We have no idea what's going to happen. What is this man, this interesting but not particularly compelling senator from Missouri do. He supports NATO. He supports the Marshall Plan. By the way, the Marshall Plan was really the Truman Plan, but he knew it would be harder to pass if it had his name on it. And so he put General Marshall. There you go. That's all you, you do that and you're there. You, you do the kinds of things we're talking about. So NATO, the Marshall Plan, containment. He integrates the military, becomes the first president to address the NAACP. Splits the Democratic Party in 1948 between Strom Thurmond and Henry Wallace. All this, you know, 
if you want actually there, if there is one presidential election you want to go read a book about that kind of feels like all the ideological factions that are unfolding now 1948 is pretty close there's not really a Tom Dewey figure sort of an establishment Republican but otherwise so Truman does all that Eisenhower five-star general conqueror of Hitler not a single American soldier died in an offensive military action during the eight years of Dwight Eisenhower's administration amazing isn't it so if you surprise us we tend to talk about you if you just give us what we expected we tend not to so under that theory that greatness is going counter to your base or surprises What's going to be the surprise of President Trump? Well, he's going to put on a toga and quote Aristotle. No. Um, uh, I, I think one of the tragedies of the era, and I'm not a Republican, I'm not a Democrat, I voted for both, plan to continue to. Um, I think that, and I use the word tragedy advisedly, is there's one guy in American politics who could get a reasonable deal on immigration, and that's Donald Trump. If he wanted to, his 48 percent, they'll just, whatever, they te whatever he tells them, they're open to. So that's Nixon to China. He could do it. You know, talk about the wall all you want, but then resurrect the 2006 deal to some extent and see what you can get. Um, and I think that's a disappointment. I think that the president has an enormous amount of political capital with his base that he has chosen not to spend. Uh, and that's a very, what I just said is a very conventional sentence. And it presupposes that we're living in a pre-2016 reality where there's the idea of capital, there's the idea of spending it. One of the things, if I may, Senator, that, and see, I, check me on this, see if you agree. Um, I believe that this particular moment is of a peace with moments in the past. That there are perennial American forces that ebb and flow, and they're flowing right now. So in that sense, I think that the Trump era makes sense. I think it's amazing it took us this long to get one, honestly. Uh, 50 years ago, 55 years ago now, uh, George Wallace carries five states and 13 percent of the popular vote in 1968 right so you can look back and see this uh, see this coming as it will this is where it's different and I've, I've run this by both President Bush and President Obama and they agree which is and they don't agree on anything so that's good um, except they like Mrs. Obama which is good um, 1933 to 2017 I think in many ways can be understood politically as a figurative conversation between Franklin Roosevelt and Ronald Reagan right so you had two great questions that we tried to decide from 33 to 17 the relative role of the state and the marketplace and the relative projection of force against commonly agreed upon foes and rivals right? so you could be a dove or a hawk but you were talking about the same struggle you could be a free market person or more of a safety net person, but it was a question of degree, not of kind in those debates. This is different. This is not a sequential chapter in that conversation. You have a free trade party that is now protectionist. Uh, you have this kind of, there's not a philosophical coherence to, to what's unfolding. And I think that one of the great appeals of Vice President Biden, among others, is he would restore that conversation. And I think a lot of people want that conversation restored. A lot of people don't. A lot of people want a more progressive answer to what the president's done. And that's the tension you're going to see unfolding over the next couple of months. So John said a few moments ago, uh, sarcastically and humorously, uh, well, I'll present uh, what we ought to do in the country. And indeed, he has presented a blueprint, and it's in the soul of America. He says the first duty of an American citizen, and he says that is to enter the arena, to resist tribalism, 
to respect facts and deploy reason to find a critical balance and to keep history in mind. You want to expand? Sure. I, and, it, and exercise a lot and eat well and uh, don't smoke. Uh, and and I, I, I'm aware of the possibility of the, the how naive and perfect. It's like a search committee. What does a search committee want? They want someone who's as tough as Tip O'Neill and as sweet as Jesus and put them all together, right? I mean, it's, we want someone to be a powerful leader but also be very transparent and listen. You know, so it, it's, you know, we always have unreasonable expectations of, of things. But I think we it, we'd always... I, one of the things I would urge, the central thing I would urge, actually, is that this isn't about him, right? This moment's about us because, and tell me if you agree with this, politicians are far more often mirrors of who we are rather than molders, right? So Edmund Burke had these two ideas of representation that either you reflect the will of your constituents or you give them your judgment. Right? It's a direct model and the trustee model, to be, to be dorky about it. And I, I think that as uncomfortable as this is for a lot of people to admit, this particular presidency reflects the reality for an extraordinary number of Americans. And that's you can dismiss that. You can try to, you know, if you're, if you're on the other side of things and you can say, oh, this isn't who we are. Vice President Biden says this isn't who we are. Again, he and I have d debated this. The hell it's not. It's who about half of us are. Just is, right? Unfortunately. Unfortunately, but it's, it's, so the argument you have to make, and again, not being partisan, the argument you have to make is, what do we, what's the story we want told about us? Do we want to be the era where we reacted against a demographic tide that is unchangeable? I personally think the ferocity of this reaction suggests the overall inevitability of what's unfolding. This is kind of a last gasp for people who look like me, right? And I, I get, I do get, um, you may get this too sometimes, I, whenever I say, I think we're going to get through this, people say, well, it's easy for you to say that. And I say, yeah, I mean, I'm a boringly heterosexual white Southern Episcopalian. There are six of us left. Uh, and I understand that. I speak from a position of immense privilege. But I also think that if people who look like me don't say this, then we're not being true to our duty. And I think that basically... The eras we, the way, the story we want told, I would argue, is one where we opened our arms and didn't clench our fists. And one of the fascinating things, I've just been noticing this the past two years or so, one of the big moments that, and, and you never know in a presidency or an era what moments actually will be looked back on what will rise and, and fall. You, you never know. It's why you have to wait a while. But one of the big moments that almost everyone now points to about George W. Bush is not necessarily the moment at ground zero with the megaphone, which was brilliant, right? It was, it's when Prince Hal became King Henry. But the moment a couple of days later when he went to the mosque in Washington and said, he didn't want anyone harmed for their faith. And it was extemporaneous remarks. He hadn't written anything down. That's what people point to. They point to President Obama singing Amazing Grace in Charleston. They, they point to President Bush Sr. resigning from the NRA after the NRA, in the wake of Oklahoma City, referred to federal agents as jackbooted thugs. They point to President Clinton's eulogy at Oklahoma City. So what holds all that together? There are moments of grace and outreach as opposed to moments 
of ferocity and close offness. And so I mentioned a minute ago that the Jeffersonian sentence was the most important ever written in the English language. Right? I am careful about hyperbole like that, largely because of the old story about the Texas school board candidate who was against teaching Spanish in the public schools and said on the stump one day, if English was good enough for our Lord Jesus Christ, it's good enough for Texas. So, yeah, careful about that. Um, when George W. Bush was governor of Texas, I told him that story. He went, that's pretty funny, asshole. <laughs> um, so it was the beginning of a beautiful friendship. Uh, but think, just think about that. What is it that you want told about yourself? And I promise you, it's not going to be moments of exclusion. They're going to be moments of inclusion. So what is the story that we're going to be able to tell of ourselves of this impeachment? It's still being written. I mean, right now, it's not a happy one, it seems to me. Um, not because I'm, I'm not arrogant enough to say I know exactly what should happen, you know, that this should be, this result should be. I know what I think, but I understand that people can have different opinions. What I don't quite understand is why you wouldn't want to hear the evidence before you came to that conclusion. Uh, and I don't, uh, Mitch McConnell at this point could buy a new boat with all the bets lost when people say, oh, he'll have to break eventually. Ask Justice Garland if McConnell ever had to break. Um, so he's got a vice grip on that caucus. I don't know, I hope he's got pictures. I don't know what it is, but um, I'm sure that never happens, sir. Uh, but I, I don't my, know about Mitch. <laughs> but I, I don't think, um, right now it seems to me it, is a, it will be an unhappy story, not necessarily because, I mean, we've never, we've never removed one of these guys, right? And it's kind of amazing. 44 presidents, Grover Cleveland counts twice, um, 45 presidencies, four major impeachment efforts, never done it. It's hard obviously. But I don't understand why, um, if you're not afraid, you have to be afraid of what they're going to say if you don't even want to let them say it. That's just common sense, right? So in the few remaining moments, I want to give the students here a chance to ask a question. No speeches, a question. So student, stand up and let's hear it. Yes, ma'am. Talk. So what kind of political polarization do you think we are seeing currently today? Do you think it's more partisan polarization where the parties are kind of sorting themselves into separate categories even further? Um, or do you think it's more ideological and that the parties are employing more extreme issue attitudes and extreme ends of the spectrum on each issue? That's a really great and hard question. Senator, what do you think? Repeat, repeat the question. Is the, is, the partisan, is the partisanship ideological or party? So are the parties becoming more extreme um, on each wing ideolog ideologically, or do you think the parties are just shaping more in unison with each other um, yeah. Are you a political science major? Yes. I could tell. Yeah. You, uh, you asked me, I, I think it's both. I think, um, yeah, the, way, the data shows, the data shows the former, right? Yeah, there's data for both. Yeah, you're, you're going to go into politics too. That's good. Uh, um, I think it's a great question. Uh, I think, yeah, I, I do think there's, there's both. I have another theory, and it's been written about, not by me, but I've become increasingly interested in it. I worry that in, a, in an era of declining association with traditional religious and spiritual institutions, that partisanship is actually becoming a religion, where you have your own prophets, you have your own holy books, you watch your own, you have your own services, your own rituals. And I 
that's uh, sociologically, that's I could make that case pretty easily, um, and I, I worry about that. I think the one of the big things that will be so fascinating about the Democratic primary is right now I think President Trump could basically, though there's no evidence for this because he hasn't challenged him, it seems to me that the president's personal sway is such that he could decide what the ideology is. I don't think there's a comparable character on the Democratic side, but there are more purist candidates than others. And so if you ended up with a Sanders versus Trump general election, for instance, that would be two deeply contrasting worldviews, to say the least. And also you would have, isn't that interesting, if that were to happen, which is not implausible, you would have a Republican nominee and a Democratic nominee, neither one of which were actually members of that party. Isn't that interesting? Not sure what that tells us, but it's not good. How about uh, John Mills Law Class? Any student there with a question? You all have John Stuart Mill teaching you. It's kind of impressive. All right, Professor Mills, do you have a question? Well, you talk about a solution. Well, what about, uh, is the solution in ideology? Is the solution in returning to parties or returning to some other belief system, whether it's religion or something? Well, I mean, where do, where do we go from here other than in the same direction? The well, sol my so solution is compromise. Well, my question is, when you say return, to whence are we returning? Well, we can't. So the, where do we go to? Yeah, so that's a great question. So when people say, oh, I, I, I want to, when, not you, but when, when, when it is said, oh, if only we could return to X, it's like, okay, find me a moment you want to go back to. 1983, that's the most plausible one, you know, the Greenspan Commission and, and that deal. But at the same time, and, and that led to 1984, where, can you imagine a world, Ronald Reagan carried 49 states, right? And I love Fritz Mondale, but my God, you know. Uh, and so is that the high watermark of that conversation between FDR and Reagan? Is sort of 83, 84? Mm, kind of, but at the same time, Iran-Contra was unfolding beneath the surface. Right, and it led to an immense crisis of confidence in in eighty six, eighty seven, uh, huge sell off, uh, middle class wages stagnated. I mean, we debt. I mean, we can we can lay this out. So I, there's not to me there's not a prelapsarian moment that you want to go one wants to go back to. Uh, is, if there were a high there's a high water mark of American liberalism in sixty five. There's probably a high water mark. Of American conservatism in that sense in about 1984. Um, I think that we, if the mission is to get to 51 percent where more people than not think, you know what, that's a fair and reasonable outcome and we're a, we're a country that I'm proud of, and you only have to get to 51, 52 percent of that, I think it's going to require, if not a restoration, of the role of reason and a new appreciation of it. Because too often, to go to the political science point, too often now we pick a team and then we decide what we think. We don't decide what we think and then try to find a polit the political means to achieve that. And so Walter Lippmann, 100 years ago, 1921, wrote a book called Public Opinion in which he said the besetting problem of modernity was going to be that we would define and then see, not see and then define. And that has been proven right. All right, final point. In uh, your book, and I will quote you, uh, you say... Accurately, I hope. Um, well, you judge. Maybe even favorably, but... Uh, you judge. You say that compromise 
is the oxygen of democracy. All right, if, um, if you compromise, that means you're respectful to the other fellow, you recognize his point of view, you're willing to meet him somewhere in between, and that there's a certain degree of humility. Isn't it going to take all of these things? Totally. No, I would argue that the, the, the three most important characteristics for any public servant, and by that I mean citizen as well, because we're all in this, this is not just the folks we send to, to Washington, is you have to be humble enough to admit a mistake and confess that you might be wrong, which is the hardest thing in the world to do, but is fundamentally essential. We wouldn't be here, particularly we wouldn't be here, if John Kennedy had not been able to learn between the Bay of Pigs and the Cuban Missile Crisis. Right? He says, he walked around saying, I'd have to resign in a parliamentary system after the Bay of Pigs. What does he do in April of 1961? He reaches out to the last person on earth before whom he wished to appear in need of tutelage, Dwight Eisenhower. Ike drove over to Camp David. They had lunch. They realized, Kennedy realizes he'd gotten spun by individual meetings. He was told by Ike, you have to put everybody in the room. That leads, in October 1962, to the executive committee of the National Security Council and a successful resolution of what Arthur Schlesinger called the most dangerous moment in human history. It was because Kennedy understood that he had to learn how to do that job better. One of the many tragedies of Dallas, as at Ford's Theater, is that in Kennedy and in Lincoln, we had presidents who were self-evidently learning on the job. Um, so it definitely requires that. It requires curiosity. You have to want to know what's going on, and you have to want to know what the other person thinks. And if you don't listen, you're not being true to the American Revolution, I think. Now, if, you, if, you're a, if your Republican colleagues got up and you typed on your phone, and if Grace had told you how to do that and walked you through it, uh, and under, you understand technology, um, uh, and you type your tweet saying, you're an idiot, and you send it off before the person's even finished, that's not right. Now, if that person, you listen to that person, and you think, boy, they're an idiot. I mean, I wouldn't say that, but, but boy, they're wrong. That's okay, right? Disagreement is what we're going to do. We're going to disagree. But I promise you, and you know this in your own lives, and Senator Graham knows it, I bet one, 99 times out of 100, you may not want to listen. You may disagree with this person. But one time out of 100, they probably have a point. And probably the best part of America happens when you think, oh, my goodness, maybe the other side has a point. So you need that kind of curiosity. Uh, and the last is empathy. And can I, if, if we're wrapping up, can I tell you one more George Bush story? Please. Okay. So George Herbert Walker Bush, as I suspect a lot of people who knew him here would agree, was the most empathetic man I've ever known. Uh, man, not politician, but person. I mean, he was always thinking about the other guy. He was not a perfect guy, right, unquestionably. But he was an imperfect man who left us a more perfect union, and that's a pretty good thing to, to have done. So let me tell you a quick story about someone named Bennett McNichol. Bennett McNichol was a fairly rotund lad, which is a key part of the story. He was a classmate of George H.W. Bush at Greenwich Country Day School in the 1930s. He was the big round kid in class. There was an annual obstacle course race that George Bush always won. He was the best athlete in the school. So the last year before Bush goes off to Andover to boarding school, the faculty says, would you let everybody have a head start this year? Bush said yes. Sarah Bay goes off and then Bush goes. And Bush is going through a series of barrels on the ground of the playground and he pops out and he looks to his right and Bennett McNichol is stuck in the barrel. Right? So imagine that, the max, the, a moment of maximum adolescent vulnerability. You're the fat kid in class, you're stuck in a barrel, George H.W. Bush is looming over you. So what does George Bush do? He reaches down, he pulls him out, and he says, come on, Bennett, we'll finish this together. Sweet story, right? Bennett McNichol told that story for 60 years because it was the nicest thing anyone had ever done for him. 
But this is not just a story about a sweet moment. I, I spent 17 years with President Bush working on this book. It was supposed to be posthumous, but he wouldn't die. <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, only one or two occasions did he really look at me as if he wanted to send me to Guantanamo. And one of them was this. I heard this story outside Bushland, and I, I took it to the president. I said, Mr. President, I just heard this story about Bennett McNichol. <laughs> First thing Bush said was, Bennett, he loved lunch. Then that, that's <laughs> not really the point, sir. He said, he was a big guy. He said, that's not the point. I said, why did you pull him out of the barrel? And he, he looked at me as if I were crazy. And he said, well, I've never been stuck in a barrel, but if I had been, I want somebody to pull me out, you idiot. You know? Really interesting thought, right? Because the golden rule is not do unto others because it's the right thing to do. Right? The golden rule is do unto others as you would have them do unto you. It's a covenant. And therefore, if we think of it as a covenant, I think it has more relevance and a greater chance to have a bigger role in our lives because there's something in it for us. And that's okay. We live in a fallen world. The Constitution was written for moments like this. The Constitution was written so that we would pull somebody out of a barrel hoping that they would pull us out. So the founders knew we would be sitting here talking like this. Well, let's just hope we can keep on doing it. Gators, let's give it up for John Meacham. <laughs>